certainly hope for the American dream, because the people who are denied participation in it by their very presence will wreck it. What is relevant about this? When I was growing up, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither did I. Who had been saved by Europe. And of course, I believed it. I didn't have much choice. One has used the myth of Negro and the myth of color to pretend and to assume that you were dealing essentially with something exotic, bizarre, and practically, according to human laws, unknown. And that I am not a war of America. I am not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. Plot twist, okay? Native Americans are not all Mongols, all right? Are not all Mongols coming over from the Bering Strait. Native Americans were very, very dark-skinned people, Negroes, if you will, okay? We'll be using a lot of those terms today as related to the text that we're dealing with, okay? So Negroid, Negro features, so on and so on. Negro phenotype, so on and so forth, okay? That's who were here in the Americas. Not only were dark-skinned people here in the Americas, but we had an empire that, le that stretched from Africa over to the Americas. That is the big missing key in history, and I'm gonna prove that today, but we're gonna start at the very, very beginning, okay? So here we have an excerpt, okay? The ancients would not understand the social construct we call race any more than they would understand the distinction modern scholars and social scientists generally drew between race and ethnicity. The modern concept of race is a product of the colonial enterprises of European powers from the 16th to the 18th century that identified race in the term of skin color and physical difference. In the post-enlightenment world, a scientific biological idea of race suggested that humans' difference could be explained by a biologically distinct group of humans, evolved from separate origins, who could be distinguished by physical differences, predominantly skin color. Such categorizations would have confused ancient Greeks and Romans. Okay? We're going to talk about that word Caucasoid, too. Because in the very next, well, this, this one here first, all right? This here first. So like I said, not the, what? All right. I'm going to take a two-second break because my doorbell. All right. So the invention of race has assisted us in the process of locating the epistemological movement. Somewhere between 1730 and 1790, when the concept of race was invented and rationalized, okay? So race, as the concept as we know it now, 1730 to 1790, is not that old, okay? So even if the very first name that they called us was black, which it wasn't, even if the very first name that they called us was black is only, I do the math. Okay, I probably should have did math, but you know, it's not my strong suit. It's only that many years old, okay? So what were we known before then? Because we as a people had to have a name, right? Because we came from somewhere, we had a culture. However, during this time, you had these scientists right because this is science this is back in the day when they're like we trust the science we by the late 19th century huxley's xanthrocroy group had been defined as nordic race where his melanocroy group became the mediterranean race his melanocroy group thus eventually comprised various dark caucasoid populations including the hamites Berbers, Somalis, Northern Sudanese, Ancient Egyptians, and Moors. So we have the Basques, okay? Yes, as there we go, mind your own plants. We are already here. 
So as you can see, now we have the breakdown of the five races. Okay, as the scribe are made famous by Carl Linnaeus. You have the Mongoloid race, the Mongolians, the Malay, the Caucasian, the African, and the American or Australiold. Okay, so if you can, if you just hear me out, hear me out to where we're going here. Number one, look at how they are depicted. Okay, obviously it's very Eurocentric because we have the Caucasian in the middle, okay? But to the Caucasians, right, we have the Mongoloid and the Mongolian and the Malay, okay? Slightly darker than the Caucasian because like I said, race was based upon skin color, okay? What we can see, right? Because you can't not see it, right? Because it's like in your face. Okay? You can't not see it. It's been seen for a long time. Forever and ever. Okay? Slight dark, uh, slightly darker than the Caucasian. And then you have the American or Australoid, okay? Australoid, Australian, but American. We're gonna keep getting there because according to mainstream history, archeology, span paleontology, in the mainstream, we, the Americans, the Native Americans came over from the Bering Strait from Asia. Okay, I'm going to continue to go on to this. But here we have, as descripted by Carl Linnaeus, by science, you know, science, Australoid, a.k.a. the American, and the Negroid, a.k.a. the African. By those very distinctions, uh, uh, American and African are similar even say melee are similar in color. Here's another depiction of them, okay? We have the Caucasian at the top, you have the Arabs in the middle, and you have the African and the uh, Americans down at the bottom. And as you can see, the Africans and the Americans were darker skinned than the rest of them, okay? So at the beginning, we have our human and our family tree. All right. And out of Africa theory was first brought up or, or the history of human civilization was first brought up. We were told that it was Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, Homo sapien, as if they were in succession. One came after the other. All this is in the source link, absolutely. Everything that I'm clipping here, all these paragraphs that I'm clipping here, everything is in the source link. You just gotta do, like I did the work, I did majority of the work. You just gotta do a little bit more of the work and, and actually read, you know? <laughs> you gotta do some work yourself, <laughs> you gotta read. However, as science continues to, to develop and show us that these species or these different cousins were all simultaneously on the earth. So while we seen that trek of us leaving Africa and populating the earth, we were encountering the Neanderthal, the Denisovan. We were encountering other hominids throughout time and throughout space, right? Throughout the history of our moving and throughout the spatial areas of our moving, we are encountering these different hominids. And while we were encountering these different hominids, we were breeding with these hominids, okay? We were breeding with these hominids and as we were breeding with them, some would take and some would not because of what is known as the Rhesus factor, which we will get into later, okay? Some of these would take and some of these would not. Eventually, we would end up wiping out that native or indigenous species or that native and indigenous species would continue moving and 
interbreed and intermingle with other species. Some of these species genes can be found in indigenous, I'm gonna say indigenous, in indigenous cultures and areas and peoples around the globe. The same DNA. What cannot be found is this Neanderthal DNA and the Denisovan DNA cannot be found of people in African descent. Most common in Vietnam, Borneo, and China. It is least common in blacks, very lowercase b, Melugenins, Jews, American Indians, and Europeans, except for Basques. Now we're going to talk about the Basques. But also, only a very few populations are entirely without it. Testimony once more to how we're spread, which is the African branch. Okay? So we have the Asians that is connected with the Denisovan, the European, which is connected with the Neanderthal or descended from the Neanderthal, and the African, which is just continued on that same lineage without any any taking over of their of their genetics okay so the Denny Solvan had the taking over the genetics because it's been carried there like I said all non-African humans carry traces of Neanderthal DNA all non-African humans carry traces of the Neanderthal DNA okay and here I have the <laughs> a clip of one of the sources okay like I said, um, Europeans and Asians share one to 4% of their nuclear DNA with Neanderthals, but Africans do not, so it's absolutely zero. And as we just seen, the Denisovan gene can be found in Europeans, except for the Basque. Now we're gonna talk about the Basque and, and why they're so special, okay? Or why they're so distinct, okay? Mm -hmm. People, which I said, they're very, very distinct, right? They're distinct in their, um, in their language and in their genetics. In their genetics, they didn't have much breeding, uh, much interbreeding, right? So you can say that they are the most indigenous Europeans, right? The most indigenous Europeans. The Neanderthals more more into the ne have more Neanderthal DNA DNA than anybody. Studies have shown that the genetic patterns and the makeup of the Basque is different to that of their neighbors. For example, the Spanish have been known to have Northern African DNA stemming from the Moorish rule of the country over 700 years, while Basques do not. Another example is their language, Urescra. Both French and Spanish, and virtually all European languages for that matter, are Indo-European languages, which are descendants of a single prehistoric language spoken sometime in the Neolithic era, sharing certain patterns, words, and grammar. However, Basque is not. In fact, Eureska is one of the oldest known languages that is not related to any other spoken language in the world. Now, this is where we have language coming in and being important in our distinction and following through history because language is spoken history. And the way that people, people speak, can you can tell them, can tell where they're from, especially us as a people. We can tell when someone is speaking and they're from a different part of the city that we live in, if they're a different part of the area, like the the region that we live in, you know, when the Southern slang, um, you can tell if, if you're from the South, you can tell somebody who has a Alabama accent from somebody who has a Virginia accent to where my ears, I just hear Southern. I don't hear a difference in accent, but you can hear and, and just the difference in, in what they say and the difference of how they talk. Language is very relevant to where we live, can pinpoint in history where we were and what we were doing at that time. Evidence comes from the rhesus factor discovered in 1940s. The blood of most humans and apparently all other primates contains this factor and is called the rhesus positive blood. Blood lacking this factor is called rhesus negative. The Basque were well known to have the highest percentage, around 33% of rhesus negative blood of any human population, and so are regarded as the original source of this factor. In the United States, some 15 of European populations are rhesus negative, while the percentage in Asian and black population is much less than this. Possession of the RH negative blood 
can be a major disadvantage for a human population. A RH negative woman who conceives an RH positive child with RH positive man will typically bear her first child without special problems. However, because of intermingling of fluids between mother and fetus, the first pregnancy builds up antibodies to the RH positive blood in the woman, which typically attack the blood of her subsequent RH positive children, causing them to miscarry, be stillborn, or die shortly after birth. This phenomenon is known elsewhere in nature, although it can occur with artificial crosses between species, such as the mule production. This scenario so far then is this. Around 600,000 years ago in Southern Europe, a species of man separated off from the ancestral line. We call the species Homo Neanderthal, the end people. The blood of the species contained of this factor A, B, or RH. Much later, possibly around 200,000 years ago in Africa, the main human line had picked up the A, B, and RH factors, possibly from other primates, and then could be classified as Homo sapiens, as people. Okay, again, these ones you can, you can um, grab from the source. And, and read the entire thing, okay? So as we can see, you have the RH negative, and if you have somebody who is RH negative and carry an R, um, R, RH positive baby, the first baby will be born without many complications. But the second baby to be born, because the body has built up antibodies against the RH positive, will be born as a stillbirth. That's how you can tell what happened or, or how we can pinpoint and make distinctions. Okay, how did these species die out? If this is what happens in our genetics, if one species is RH positive and another species is RH negative, when we have those intermingling and interbreeding, this is where we have the falling out of the Neanderthal people. A major people. archaeological dig in Southern California could rewrite mm -hmm. the history books. And picture of the RH positive overtaking the RH negative, right? And the RH negative only surviving among a certain, you know, a certain amount of people. Okay, I'm trying to be copacetic. The Neanderthals, all right? Surviving around the Neanderthals and their damn descendants, all right? Recently, researchers believed humans reached North America 15,000 years ago. A new findings published in the journal Nature suggests there was human activity 130,000 years ago. Scientists believe these primitive beings came between Neanderthals and archaic Homo sapiens. Maria Villarreal is at the San Diego Natural History Museum. Maria, good morning. Well, good morning. It took more than 20 years to put together this very complicated puzzle, but in the end, their findings, including this very large tusk right here, could rewrite and reshape how we feel about human evolution. Highways are an everyday part of life in Southern California, but it turns out humans may have traveled here long before anyone could have imagined. As a paleontologist, so it's it's really amazing to have discovered a site of such importance in our own backyard. This archaeological shocker began in 1992 when scientists from the San Diego Natural History Museum uncovered the bones of a mastodon 10 feet under a highway construction site. In a way, it's, this is like a, a paleo crime scene. Paleontologist Tom Demeray was one of the first to arrive and almost instantly knew they'd uncovered something special. The important fractures are these fractures here. See how smooth and curved that is? This is the kind of fracture that's produced from impact. The team believes the heavy femur bones could only be broken by a human using a two-handed tool, possibly to extract marrow for food. By replicating the breaking patterns and using state-of-the-art dating methods, the group concluded humans first reached the Americas over 130,000 years ago, not 15,000 years ago, as previous research has suggested. There's room for skepticism, uh, for sure. But USC Associate Professor Dr. Christian Carlson wants more evidence. One instance is fascinating, but I think we need to find another site or two before we begin to accept this. I was a strong critic when I first looked at this, and I said, well, I, I can't believe that this is really here, but, but this is science. Archaeologist Stephen Holland has spent most of his career researching prehistoric human existence and is led to face critics who aren't yet ready to rewrite history. We're expecting pushback. We expect people to be critical. We want people to be critical. What makes you so sure that something else didn't break it over time? People have been doing these experiments for years and say that only humans with hammerstones can produce these kinds of features. 
While there are still a lot of unanswered questions, the president of the museum joked yesterday that this is just proof that even early humans wanted to live here in San Diego. Gail? Okay. We also have um, a, a doctor, Moreno Estrada, okay, who also has been doing research with DNA cons um, consisting of North Amer uh, Native American, South Americans, to be specific, and Polynesian people, and how the Native American and Polynesian people's bloods have been mixing, at least, at the very least, since 1200 AD. At the very least, the Polynesians and the Native, Amer Native South Americans, I, I just wanna say Americans because it's just all one continent, the Americas, and we're gonna get to that. Um, the Native Americans and the Polynesians' blood have been mixing long, long, long before Columbus came upon the shores, all right? How did that happen? What, how were they getting that? How did they miss a whole hundred thousand years? <laughs> There's a lot of hows. Lucia was pretty much like every other 20 year old of her generation. She was fairly short, around 152 centimeters tall, and liked hanging out with her friends and snacking on fruit and nuts. All of which might seem pretty boring, except that Lucia died over 11,000 years ago. Her remains, which include her skull, pelvis, an arm bone, and a couple of leg bones, are the oldest human fossils in the Western Hemisphere. And about two weeks ago, they burned along alongside some 20 million items in the Brazil National Museum when the main buildings caught fire. The museum had stood for 200 years before the blaze brought it to the ground on September 2nd. The fire started why. in the evening after the museum was closed, and thankfully none of the museum staff were harmed. But the fire didn't spare countless priceless and irreplaceable artifacts. Until authorities sort through the ash, we won't know exactly what is gone and what can be salvaged, but it's likely that Luzia's remains are among the treasures destroyed by the flames, which is not only a loss for the museum and the country of Brazil, but also for science. Radiocarbon estimates of charcoal found near her bones estimate that she's roughly between 11,200 and 11,700 years old. That makes her about 2,000 years older than any other human fossils from the Americas. And it's not- Okay, can, can we just like, all right? So the time that Native Americans were supposed to have come, and, or the Native Mongolians were supposed to have come over the Bering Strait. We have fossils dating back to that time already in Brazil. Not just her age that makes her special, it's also her face. You see, her over- Oh! I wonder why they burned those bodies, huh? I wonder why they burned those bones! Cranium, pronounced chin, and projecting face kind of put a damper on the main theory of how the Americas were first populated. When Luzia was discovered in 1975, paleontologists thought our species arrived in the Americas via a single movement of people from Northern Asia. That's because the fossil skulls they had at the time all had facial features that were similar to North Asian faces. But Luzia's skull looks more like the skulls of people living in Africa. And because of that, along with other bits of evidence that have arisen since, paleontologists Paleontologists now think the Americas were populated in waves. For all that Luzia taught scientists, though, she had so many more secrets she could have revealed. Paleontologists were especially eager to look at Luzia's genes, but the methods for extracting DNA weren't advanced enough yet for such an old fossil. And the museum was hoping to preserve the skeleton until those advancements happen. Even if parts of her are recovered from the ash, the heat from the blaze likely destroyed what little DNA may have remained. And Luzia is one of just millions of specimens that burned. Much of the anthropological collection is likely gone, including stunning cultural artifacts from around the world and the only recordings of indigenous languages no longer spoken. Species of delicate lace bugs found nowhere else were incinerated along with much of the entomology collection. And many of the destroyed are what scientists call holotypes, the specimens that define species. These heartbreaking losses show just how fragile museum collections are. It's all too easy to lose these institutions that let us travel back in time and that protect specimens until technology or our understanding advances <laughs> far enough to learn more from them. Which is exactly what happened with our next discovery. Okay, facts. Absolutely. So how would these people have traveled? How would these people have traveled? Because surely savages, you know, thinking like you just get lost out to sea. You can't get lost out to sea when you know these currents.
All right. There is no lost out to sea. So you have these currents moving from Africa over to the Americas, as you can see, and also from a, uh, the Americas on the Western coast over to Australia. Okay, so you can hit all of Polynesia, and this is how we had the intermingling of these species and of these people, okay? Native Americans and Polynesians, Native Americans and Africans, all intermingling throughout history, and we can continue to go on and prove that. Now, here's the part where I'm going to relax, and we're just going to talk and let the pictures be here in the background, okay? So, so far, what we're hearing about human history is that most of it is has been a lie, okay? Most of it has been, not, not a lie, but a lot of omission has happened. Um, a lot of whole pokings don't get as much light as they should for fear of something. Maybe that something is white supremacy. Maybe the fear of knowing that we were a global people would get it out of us in our heads that we owe the Europeans for our lifestyle. We owe the Europeans for opening up the world. We owe the Europeans for the modern world that we have today. And that is not true. Why do I have giants going around in the background? Because if they are lying and omitting about how old our species really is, then what else could they be lying about? Okay? Because giants are not mythological creatures at all. There is archaeological evidence of it. And maybe, just maybe, once you put these pieces from, I want, I don't want, I don't want to bring it up, but the Bible, you know, would could also be looked at as a historical document. Not the King James Version now. Not the King James Version now. I'm talking about, we're talking about Greek, we're talking about Hebrew, we're talking about Arabic, okay? If we're looking and we're reading, it describes a lot of different things and it pokes a lot of different holes, okay? A lot of the great inventors and great thinkers of our times accredit, oh, this is one I missed. This is one I missed. This is, I, I had this thought in the beginning and now see it's coming back because I know what I want to say, but I forgot to research this part. So this is not in the source. Damn it, I fucked myself up. However, you can look it up yourself and notice how many great thinkers attribute it to their, their sparks of inventions to a higher power. If you were not open up to the higher power, how can you, you know, there's also other, you know what, I'm just going to scrap that. That's going to be for another conspiracy. We could delve deep into how our minds influence experience, experiments, okay? How thought influence the reality the the real world using science and using receipts okay but i'm not gonna touch that now because i don't have the thing not the king james version never the king james version the nephilim existed right because we don't have the proper names we do not have the proper names so the nephilim the giants there were people bigger than the average human they existed during these times and they are very we'll say, we'll say, Yao Ming okay would be considered a giant but like I said as we see through genetics a lot of these breeds die out mm -hmm. lost chapters of Enoch as speaking of uh, Nephilims yes but we're not we're not going into that excuse me because like I said I want to have everything pinpoint receipts okay so we can discuss that as as these pictures are going on but we're just gonna put a little pictures of, of what we found you know because I, I needed some time to transition into the uh, second part of our uh, second half of our um, 
of our conspiracy because the second half is really where we're going to be hitting you hard with the super duper facts that's going to blow your mind. This is just scratching the surface. We're really just scratching the surface here with these things, okay? Men bigger than rhinos being depicted all throughout history. Bones, skulls, all throughout history. If this is what they're giving us for history, what are they not giving us for history? Okay? Meaning, if they are telling us that there were no giants in the Americas, then why are you depicting giants reaching and talking to Europeans? Why are you, why are you talking about that? Yes, uh, we're not we're talking about pygmies as well. Yes, the pygmy people existed as well, but pygmies are way more acceptable and palate, palate, palatable, palatable, palatable to accept into society. Pygmies are way more because they're not threatening. No disrespect, but pygmies are not threatening, right? Unless they are mad of them in mass. There's, they're not threatening. Giants, however, are very threatening to the average sized human. Okay? And last but not least, we have to get an article, okay? The St. Paul Globe, January 24th, 1904. Bones of a human skeleton 11 feet high are dug up in Nevada. Winnemucca, Nevada, June 23rd. Workmen engaged in digging gravel here today uncovered at depth of about 12 feet a lot of bones, part of a skeleton of a giant human being. Dr. Samuels examined them and pronounced them to be the bones of a man who, might, who must have been nearly 11 feet in height. The metal carpal bone measure four and a half inches in length and are large in proportion. A part of the ulna was found and the complete form would have been between 17 and 18 inches in length. The remainder of the skeleton is being searched for. <laughs> Frankly, that would kind of suck to be a giant in the army like that. You would see hella people riding, but you, but, but you see, but back in the day, I mean, you, you, you know, it's not like they had cannons and something well you know like sword fighting days back in like the sword fighting it's not like they had cannons if you see an, a giant and an army like you see goliath you'd be like nah we're not fucking with those guys oh let me get my camera all right so oh second half yes i'm gonna get my cam to go on and stuff more all right it's a little doozy there it's a little doozy there, I know. Stay with me though. Stay with me though. We're going to address some of the some of the comments that I seen popping up in the in the chats. Okay, no, that was a little bit of a doozy. So the first thing we must address is the word "more." Now the word "more" is not a European word. The word "more" extends far beyond Europe. Okay. The word more can go all the way to Kemet or ancient Egypt. Here we have hieroglyphs of the word mer, okay, mer, more, okay, mer, M E R, M U U R, M O O R, M A U R, okay? The, the vowel sounds always are different. Mm -hmm. Enjoy, enjoy, tiny. <laughs> The vowel sounds are always different, okay? But the consonant sounds will be the same. The consonant sounds will be the same. So we have mer here in hieroglyphs. Now the word mer is used for different things. Water being a lot, being one of the things. Water, and it means uh, pyramid, okay? It's the comedic word for pyramid. It's also used um, in the Medunetter to describe kings, gods uh like this god here and i uh, i don't know i'm not i'm not sure if i have the clip of the king's names but um it's around here somewhere 
Okay. So more or mer is a very, very old word that was used in ancient Kemet. Okay. And as we know from Kemet, as, as we've described, and as we've seen in a lot of different conspiracies, all right, that they were indeed Nubians. They were Negroid people. And as we've, I think we've kind of established that with the trajectory of, of human, um, you know, human history and our evolution, that majority of the world has been Negroid, okay? I think we established that part in the first half, okay? If you missed it, you got to go watch it back again. Majority of the world has been Negroid, and Negroid people have been all parts of the globe, all right? Now, as far as the word mer and, and the people, the words, language, right? Language is where we're at. Language is very important, okay? Um, where is this one at? Okay, there we go. Now we have to distinguish, uh, hey, it's Mama Mia. Welcome in, welcome in. We have to distinguish between the Moors, all right? We have to distinguish between the Muslims, the Arabs, the uh, Moors as a whole, the Sub-Saharan Africans, okay, which would be we're going to go there. Uh, the Mozarab, which is what we're looking up right here, the Mozarabs, uh, the Malundi, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of them. The Moriscos, okay? The Moors consisted of a lot of different people and a lot of imposters, Okay, wait for it, Callie. Uh, I can't, I'm so I can't. I as a, as you know, you're a music person, and I know I have a lot of music people in here too. So I hope that I hope that I did something with the music. All right. So we have Muslim, Arab, and Christian. Okay, during these times, during these times, we did not have the labels black or white or Middle Eastern. Okay. We had the labels Muslim, which we would akin to black people. Okay. Muslim meant black. You can be an Arab Muslim or you can be a sub-Saharan Muslim or a Kemetic Muslim. Okay. You could also be um, a Kemetic or a Muslim or Arab Jew sorry, an Arab Jew, a Jewish Moor, so on and so forth. Moor was the blanket term for either A, the army, the empire consisting of the people, or more likely the Negroid feature people. Because the Arabs who we see here, who are the Mozarabs, the Mulawandi, so on and so forth, and the top of the some of the dynasties that we were at that were trying to control the dark-skinned people as we will see with the influx of Islam as a political movement. Back again, we have to talk about back in those days, it was not Islam as a religion. There was no such thing as a holy war. When we talked about Islam back then, you were talking about the religion. When you talked about Muslim back then, you were talking about the Moors as the people, the Muslim people, the Moorish people, the people where Islam is presiding at because Islam was the presiding religion and holy faith in the Moorish Empire. <laughs> so, as it stands, Muslim equals black, Arab is your Middle Eastern, and Christian is your white, okay? Christian is white, Catholicism is the religion, right? Muslim is black, Islam is the religion. That's how we have to think when reading these, in back in these days, reading the text. When someone says Muslim versus when someone says Islam. When someone says Christian versus someone says Catholicism or Christianity, okay? Christian means white, all right? In this time, and Muslim means black. So we have the Mozarab here. Um, the, the, clip, uh, the part that I wanted to have here is um, the Mozarab, including Christianized Iberian Jews. Now, this is the Muslim rule, right? This is under Muslim rule and specifically the Umayyad Caliphate. And we, we'll talk about that. After expelling the Visigoths and imposing their rule, their Muslim rule, Mozarabs any type of Christians or anyone not of the more, more descent 
Islamic faith or anything like that were treated differently, okay? They were treated differently, especially being taxed. They would be taxed because of their difference to practice their religion under Moorish rule, specifically under the Umayyad dynasty. They would be taxed to practice Christianity and to practice Judaism and so on and so forth. Of the vast majority of Mozarab kept Christianity and their dialects descended from Latin. Eventually, some converted to Islam and were influenced in varied degrees by Arab customs and knowledge and sometimes acquired greater social status in doing so. That is the part I want to keep clear. They acquired greater social status by adopting the Arab or the Moorish customs and knowledge, okay? That influence, that spark where, where, where people talk about uh, the Moors civilizing Europe, okay? This is the Moors civilizing Europe. We did have advanced customs. We did have advanced knowledge. However, there were still problems going on because at the end of it, when you have people in power, power corrupts. And when you have people with nefarious means, nefarious shit happens. And very beginning, if we gave birth to civilization, right? the genetics and how human civilization came about, right? Modern humans, all being homo sapiens, all coming from Africa. If we gave birth, right, to the Neanderthals and when we gave them the Neanderthals and, and they gave them birth to the, to the now Europeans and the Neanderthal descendants and so on and so forth. If that, it came from us, we should not treat our children this way. And at the very beginning, I might catch some slack for this, but I am big on accountability. Anybody knows me. I am big on accounta fucking ability. All right. We have to take accountability to what we did to our children, meaning the Europeans. And as we'll see, I'm not going to get too deep because I'm not dragging today. I'm, I'm uplifting today. But I have, we have to be real and we have to be realistic about what happened under, under our gate, under our rule, okay? What we let allowed happen and how we felt because of things that were happening, because of the influences that were happening. I'm big in karma, okay? So you can't. You can't do you can't do fuck shit and expect not fuck shit to happen back to you, okay? And that's that's what I'm gonna say on that. So we have the Mozarabs who try to be more imposters, okay? More imposters. And this is where the confusion happens. Okay, these are also different names and different types. The Mulandi, okay. Muslims of local Iberian descent of mixed Arab, Berber, and Iberian origin who lived in Al Andalus during the Middle Ages. In Sicily, Muslims of local descent or of Arab, mixed Berber, Arab, or Sicilian origin were also referred to as the Mulawad. They were also called the Mus uh, Musalima. In broader usage, the word mulawad is used to describe Arabs of mixed percentages, especially those not living in essential homelands. So as you can see, we have classifications and specifications for how much Arab or Moorish blood that you have mixed in with people. The mulandi, the mulawad sounds like the octoroons, the mulattoes, so on and so forth, right? Or am I reaching? Is that a reach? Or is this not the same thing? And the ma uh, maula, okay, is a polysemous Arabic word whose meaning varied in different periods and contexts. Before the Islamic prophet Muhammad, the term originally applied to any form of tribal association. In the Quran and Hadith, it is used in a number of sense, including Lord, Guardian, Trustee, and Helper. After Muhammad's death, this institution was adopted by the Umayyad dynasty, again, to incorporate new converts to Islam into an Arab Muslim society. The word Mulawat was uh, Mawali gained currency as an appellation for converted non-Arab Muslims in the early Islamic caliphates.
non-Arab Muslims. Who is the non-Arab Muslims? Again, like I said, non-Arab, meaning you're not from the Middle East, Muslims, you're black, all right? This is now where we're distinguishing converting Islams, converting the sub-Saharan or the Negroid, the Negroes, converting them into Islam, and we can see why as we understand the empire, okay, the Moorish empire and what was going on, because like Homie said in the beginning, it's very, it's very important to understand what time period that we're talking about, what Moorish time period that we're talking about. I'm glad you guys see it too. Trying to view to the golden age of tolerance is that Jews and Christians were severely restricted in Muslim Spain by being forced to live in a state of demitude. A demi is a non-Muslim living in an Islamic state who is not a slave but does not have the same rights as a Muslim living in the same state. Okay? Hence why you are Muslim, why you're Malawandi, why you're so on and so forth. Why you imposter, okay? Because you don't have the same rights, all right? Sounding familiar? Is it scary or is it sounding familiar? Just saying. In Islamic Spain, Jews and Christians were tolerated if they acknowledged Islamic superiority, accepted Islamic power, paid a tax called a jizya, to the, uh, uh, or I'm uh, sorry if I'm butchering this shit, I don't speak Arabic, to the Muslim rulers and sometimes paid higher rates of other taxes, avoided blasphemy, did not try to convert Muslims, complied with the rules laid down by authorities. I'm sorry, but is it sounding familiar? These rules included restrictions on clothing and needing to wear a special badge, restrictions on building synagogues and churches. They were not allowed to carry weapons, could not receive an inheritance from a Muslim, could not bequeath anything to a Muslim, could not own a Muslim slave. A Dimi man could not marry a Muslim woman, but the reverse was acceptable. A Dimi could not give evidence in an Islamic court. Dimis would get lower compensations than Muslims for the same injuries. At the same time, there were restrictions on practicing one faith too obviously. Bells ringing or chanting too loudly were frowned on and public processions were restricted. Bells ringing? Is it ringing bells? Again, this is under the Umayyad dynasty in Muslim controlled Spain and Portugal, okay? The Umayyad dynasty. I'm glad you guys see it. So we have very various distinctions of Moors and who is who, okay? And as we see, these are the Moors where we had the highest rule. The last Moor that we talked about ruled the King, the Sultan of Morocco was 1672. Remember that, 1672, all right? Does anybody want to go ahead and Wikipedia when the state the nation state, the incorporated Morocco was here. Before that, it was the kingdom of Morocco and the kingdom of Morocco was really the Moorish empire. As we will see, and as I will continue to show, I'm telling you, we're getting deeper. We're getting deeper into it. So you have the big standing armies and you have the ones who impostered, the ones who adopted the customs, Okay, because they would gain higher status. People would look at them like, oh, you somebody. Because again, we are not a monolithic people. Yes, we have dark skin, but we come in lots of shades. So it's easy for you to imposter a Moor when you have the same shade or close to the same shade as the Moor, but because of Moorish rule, your mother had you know, relations with the Moor and bore you and you became the Malandi, the Muzarab, and so on and so forth. Under the Abbasid dynasty, women lost their statuses in society, but under the Umayyad dynasty, women held a high status in society, okay? Because we are inherently a matriarchal people, okay? We are a matriarchal people, and we will forever clash with patriarchal ideologies.
we will forever clash with patriarchal ideologies because we inherently are a matriarchal people. Please note that. So this is how far they say the spread of Islam happened. But like I said, and we are going to prove, it extended over to the Americas as well. Again, just, just more depiction of what was happening, you know, slave trading, okay? The word slave comes from the word Slav, all right? The Slavic people, okay, of Western Europe were the original slaves, okay, being traded by these people here. I'm not going to bring up their name because I don't want my game to be, I, mean, I don't want my stream to be shut down but being sold by these people here to the Moors, okay? For their infamous harems, all right? A, a, lot, a lot of women were sold into these infamous harems and you can go and research about all the, the digs that the Italian talk about, uh, you know, people being Moorish blood or having Moorish blood and all, all the shit the Italians get and, and the Iberians get for having Moorish blood and not being pure pure white okay and just a little bit more like i said we're going to talk about accountability right the alternative uh blah, 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 blah. okay we just, yeah okay i guess all of it is the thing the alternative even the spiciest of tea though that's not even the spiciest of tea though but that's what i said at the very beginning if we are to learn from the past if we are not to continue to make the same mistake should we not be told the whole truth how far does this rabbit hole go you ready Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Really fucking ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Here we fucking go. Okay, okay, okay. I know that's that was that was a little heavy. I know that was a little bit heavier. No, that was a little bit heavier. So there were distinct, and this is again, these are Europeans, all right, making these connections and discoveries. Majority Europeans making these connections and discoveries as it relates to the uh, Africans and the Native American exchange, okay, and the similarities in the language and the similarities in the metallurgy as described here, okay. A little bit here, just when it could, gold was probably not the only item that the early Mandinka explorers brought with them. Columbus was surprised to find the native people of the Americas bartering with a woven cloth identical in design and style to that which he had seen in West Africa. In the journal of the third voyages, he noted that the Indians brought handkerchiefs of cotton very symmetrically woven and worked in colors like those brought from Guinea and the rivers of Sierra Leone and of no difference. He was so startled by this discovery that he remarked, but they, the Indians, cannot communicate with the latter, West Africans, because from here to Ghana is a distance of, of more than 800 leagues, 2,400 miles. Columbus made several references to Alipman Czar, a cloth the Moors, Spanish or North American, North African Muslims, imported from West Africa into Morocco, Spain, and Portugal. Ferdinand Columbus called the native cotton garments breech cloths of the same design and cloths as the shawls worn by Moorish women of Granada. Hernan Cortez, another infamous Spanish conqueror, described the dress of the Indians as follows. The clothing in which they wear is like long veils, very curiously worked. The men wear breech cloth in their bodies, large mantles, very thin, and painted in the styles of the Moors. Okay. <laughs> did you did you did you get it? Did American of American Native American trade with Africa, right? So far as the um the mummies having tobacco and cocaine, right? 
in the tombs, all right? Suggesting that they, they've been trading for that long, okay? I think that's kind of like, you know, kind of like common knowledge, not common knowledge, but like, you know, a little broad Twitter fact, you know, like, you know, that we seen on Facebook years ago that, you know, the ancient Egyptians had tobacco and cocaine in their shit. Yeah, it was getting lit. All right. But however, we know that the Spanish were the first, right? The first European waves to come over and conquer the Americas. So a lot of townships and regions in different colonial settings and areas were Spanish names, okay? That's how you got uh, Ocho Rios in Jamaica um, and, and other various countries where it's not really Spanish speaking or Spanish speaking or we don't say that they're, the Spanish were the first to colonize over here. The rest of the Europeans came over in waves. What does it have to do with this, Fox? Well, if we look here at this, uh, I know I got some Brazilians. I know I got some Brazilian friends out here. We have uh, in Brazil, there is a place called Ser Sergipe, Sergipe in Brazil. Okay. We have Sergipe in Brazil, uh, which is called Sao, Sao Costa, something like that. Some, it's, it's called a different name now. But even before it was changed from, to Sao Costa something from Sergipe, it was called Sergipe del Rey. As it's called Sergipe del Rey, Wikipedia will tell you that Sergipe is a native word for river of crab. And as Cal and I were talking, you know, both being Spanish speakers, you know, river of crab of the king don't really make sense. You know, like these titles make sense. However, what does make more sense if we're looking at it as Spanish, because again, the Spanish colonized here, right? The Spanish colonized here. We have Ser Jipe, okay? We have Ser Jipe. And if you, if you are a Spanish speaker, Ser, right? To be Ser Jipe. And what Spanish speakers do, and what I said to Cali, what I was saying when I was making these connections, I was like, you know what, what a lot of Spanish speakers do is we make contractions of words. We don't say the whole, the whole words, especially a lot of the Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, the Spanish speakers who kept their heavy, heavy Moorish influence. Okay. Ser Jipe, Ser y Jipe. Okay. Now, if you look at it like Ser y Jipe. Ser Egipe, to be Egyptian, to be Egyptian of the crown or to be the Egyptian king, okay, of the Egyptian king. That makes more sense knowing the history that we have between the different um, trading happening between the North America or the Native Americans, keep saying North, the Native Americans and the Africans, okay? Ser Egipe del Rey, to be of Egyptian of the king of the crown, okay? To be Egyptian of the king or of the crown, all right? Makes more sense than the river of crabs king of the crown or the king river of crabs. Like, I mean, I get it, but like the king river of crabs as a, a state name, I don't think so. I don't think so. So again, just a little bit of piecing together and how maps change to destroy history and facts happening in there. Because once you destroy this name right here, you destroy the evidence, okay, that we were here before Columbus, okay? We were here before Columbus. We had Islamic, Arabic, Muslim, whatever they're trying to tell you it is, there were Moorish influences here in the West, all right? In the new world. There, the new old world. There was already Moorish influences here, as you can see. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> this is a big spicy one. We're at the beginning of the spice. We're at the beginning of the hard hitting spice. Hit that source command if you need to, if you missed it, but it's there. The king, to our officials who reside in the city of Seville at the House of Trade of the Indies, 
We are informed that because of the increase in the price of Negro slaves in Portugal and in the islands of Guinea and Cape Verde, Cabo Verde, shout out, some merchants and other persons who intend to have them for Indies have gone or seen to buy Negroes in the islands of Sardinia, Majorca, or Minorca, and other parts of Levanta in order to send them to our Indies because they say that they are cheaper. And because many of the Negroes in those parts of the Levant are of the race casta, casta, race and casta, caste are two different things, are of the casta, are of the caste of the Moors and other trade with them. And since in a new country where at present our holy Catholic faith in the Indies in the Americas, is being established, it is not fitting that the people of this quality, the Moors, that know themselves, should go there on account of the difficulties that could come from it. I order you that under no circumstance or by any means shall you consent to the passage to our Indies, islands, or terra firma of any Negro slaves who may be from the Levant or who may have grown up there, or of other Negroes who may have been reared with Moriscos, remember that word, even though they be the race of Negroes of Guinea, West Africa, made in Val Valladolid, July 16th, 1550, Maximiliano the Queen, by order of His Majesty, His Highness, in his name, Juan de Semano, seal of the council. You are informed that if such Moors are by their nationality and origin, by their nationality and origin, by their nationality and origin, two different things, and if they should teach Muslim doctrines or wage war against you or the Indians who may have adopted the Muslim religion, you shall not make them slaves by any means whatsoever. On the contrary, you shall convert them or persuade them by good and legitimate means to accept our holy Catholic faith. Do we need a second to digest that, or do we kind of know what was said here? Because this is where we're getting deep now. Anybody who knows their nationality, who knows that they are Moors, cannot, shall not be enslaved. However, you shall persuade them to join the holy Catholic faith because once they denounce that they are Moors, once they adopt that they are Christians, Christians, and denounce that they are Moors, we can then enslave them. Why was it that slavery at the very beginning, we were looked at as property, couldn't even, you know, as property, as cattle, you don't need to make sure your cattle is following your religion. But at some point in time, slaves became baptized and Christianized into the religion, into the Christian faith. Why? Why? Again, depictions of Native Americans as seen by the Europeans when they first got here, looking like this. Very weird behavior for savages. Very weird clothing for savages. Very weird clothing for savages. Just saying, okay? Okay, when we're depicting, when we're depicting, okay, Native Americans during this time, we're depicting them with very dark skin. They don't look like $5 Indians. They don't look like your $5 Indians.
Indians who control all the reservations and the casinos that are on those reservations. However, you have dark skin Native Americans not even allowed to join those tribes because some European paper called the Dolls Rolls said that they didn't have the Native American blood because they were classified as Negroes during their paper genocide because not all of us were fucking slaughtered. That's right. Only a very, very small percentage of Africans were shipped to North America. Hmm. If that is the case, where did everybody else come from? Where did everybody else come from? I'm reaching again. I got to be reaching. Fox, you are a fucking reach, bro. Like, you got to stop reaching. There's no way that there were Moors here. There's no way because America, America comes from Americo Vespucci. That's what was an Italian explorer. However, we had a, we had the Spanish who were over here primero, right? We know primero, we had the Spanish who were over here primero, and they encountered several tribes that had, hmm, what is this word, Google? Did I mean America here? Sure, you got damn right I did. Amaru, 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 Amaru. In mythology of the Andean civilizations of South America, the Amaraka or Amaruka or Katari is a mythical serpent or dragon, okay? In this religion of the ancient Andes of the Incan, Tupac Amaru, Tupac Amaru Shakur, what does Tupac have to do with the Moors? I'll tell you. Maybe I won't. I'll just leave it up to you to figure out and to decide for yourself. Yes, those was bars. I am really spitting. When asked about Tupac's name, why name him Tupac Amaru? Who is that? His mother, Afini, said, I wanted him to have the name of a revolutionary indigenous people of the world. I wanted him to know that he was part of a world culture, not from a neighborhood. Tupac Amaru was the last Incan to go against and to subsequently fall against the Spanish colonizers in South America. What the hell does Afini Shakur what the hell do I got to do with you, lady? What? I can't find a distinction. Like, why would she, out of all the revolutionaries, out of all the Marcus Garveys and, 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 and Elijah Muhammad's and the, out of all of these, we go for a quote unquote revolutionary indigenous people of the world because I wanted him to know that he was part of a world culture. The Amarukans, the Amarukans, the Americans. Okay. Pierce researched an article written in the Theolo Theosophical Society mentioned entitled, uh, magazine entitled Lucifer, which gave insights to the world America. He said that it is the chief god of the Mayan Indians in Central America was Quetzalcoatl or Kokukan, the plumed serpent, feathered serpent. So not only were the Incan worshiping the feathered serpent, but so were the Mayan. In Peru, this god was called Amaru in the territory also known as Amaruca. And who came to their territory? Was it the Spanish? And the Spanish knew that they were the Amaruca, so they were going to call them the Amarucans and the territory the Amaruca, because that's what Europeans do. They just blanket everything. Hey, these people call themselves the Amaruca. We're just going to call this whole place Amaruca. But wait, there's more. We also have the Amarisque Mountains, okay, from the Amarisque Indians, okay? They, Amarik, 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 where are we going? Where are we going with this? Is this not another version of America? Couldn't quite possibly be. No, that's another reach, except we have a little, um, you know, thing here from the old version of Amaruka or Amarik or America, not from Amarco Vespucci, not from Amarico 
Vespucci. America was never called India. It was not named after America Vespucci, and that America is truly the land in the West. America, also Amaruka, um, also Amaruka, the land of the plume serpent. In, uh, um, in Latin, that is Almaricanos. In Arabic, Al Morocco. In Meru Netter, Meru, or Mur, Mur. The Arab uh, Aboriginal peoples of the America are the Americans, the Amarukans, the Amarikans, the Amarokans, the Moors, the Moors, the Moros. Still reaching? I still got to be reaching. Am I reaching? I still got to be reaching. Fox, you don't, you, there's no way, Fox. There's no way, Fox. Ain't no way you got to be reaching. <clears throat> <clears throat> the colonization of the Americas by the Spanish was an extension of the Reconquista, the recon reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula. Muslims had ruled much of Spain for over 700 years, dominating Europe culturally, educationally, and economically. The early explorers were, in many cases, Spanish soldiers who had fought in Spain or Africa and sailed the seas to destroy the power of Islam. They recognized the influence of Islam wherever they journeyed and did everything in their power to convert the people to Catholicism. When Hernan Cortez, the conqueror of Mexico, arrived in the Yucatan, he named the area El Cairo Sergipe. The men of Cortez and Juan Pizarro, the conqueror of Peru, is America really Egypt? Sorry, I'm not, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to go there yet because I still needed, I needed, this was too much. We're going to go there soon though. All right. Some of whom had taken direct part in the struggle against the Muslims called the Indian temples Mesquitas, Spanish for Majid. Ironically, the first Christian to see the American land, Rodrigo del Tariana, on his return to Spain, became a Muslim, abandoning his Christian allegiance. Columbus did not give him any credit, nor did the king give him any recompense. Are we still getting hot? Is it still hot in here? But wait, there's more. Play on words. In 1621, the word Indian was substituted for the word Moorish. That single alteration killed the rest of our world, okay? And so many parts here. The state of Delaware wanted to classify all Native Americans as black, says Daisy. We've had a census every 10 years and they instructed the census takers to not, do not put Native American on any census report. Put anything else except Native American. Mulatto was a favorite term they used. Colored, Negro, mulatto, and in some cases, white, depending how light you were. That is a native quote, all right? An indigenous person's quote, all right? Go ahead in the source, okay? <laughs> That's the one that the message from the queen was saying, yes, do not let the Moors go over there because they are already all over the place. Islam is already all over the place. The peace cast castaway, castaway, not castaways, castaways, the, the peace castaway, castaway, them, lost something more than their tribe. They lost their identity as a people. The government at the time did not have a census category for Native Americans, so they were counted as and considered mulatto or Negro. Not only did society not view them as people, them, they were not even seen as Native Americans. Although they still self-identified as Native Americans, their traditions faded with time. They were regarded as outsiders in their own communities, neither white nor black, but something different and undefined. Negro, colored, black are fictitious, fictitious, fictitious names. Fictitious names. That's not you. That's not who you are. That's how they control you, as we will see and continue to demonstrate. Y'all not ready for the facts? Proclamations affirming Moors are aboriginals. Many active and conscious Moorish Americans across the North American continent have been consistent and dedicated in their duties and responsibilities to answer up to their constitution principles in exercising our inalienable rights and their divine birthrights. Moors have been working to take their place in the affairs of men. A proclamation is the act of proclaiming or publishing what is 
a avow, okay, an open declaration, okay, to declare. This act causes some state matters to be published or to be made generally known, and by virtue of the said matter being placed in written form issued by proper authority, you have to proclaim something and then write it down, and then so it may be. Okay? Okay? United States North American Republic Constitution, full faith and credit shall be given to each state and to public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may be general laws prescribed by manner which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved in effect thereof. Therefore, in these locations and territories, Moors have been recognized as aboriginals indigenous to the North American and South American continent. Chicago. Here we have um, a little clip I have here from the Delaware government, uh, government website. You can go look it up yourself, their titles and their state codes concerning the Lenape tribe. All right, again, a government website. You see what it says there? Uh, does anybody see what it says there? And the, and the government website about the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware, what does that say there? Number four, that the tribe was formerly known as the Moors, what? And for many decades had been unofficially recognized for at least up to 125 years by a license plate with an M in it. Wait, what? No, wait, Fox, what are you doing? Not you going into the Library of Congress, the website of Library of Congress, where you can go and search up yourself like I'm doing now and download this same article right here from the congressional records. What does the congressional records say, Fox? What does it say? No, it was Fox, you got to zoom in. Pass Fox, you got to zoom in. We can't see it. What? What does that say? What does that say, Fox? Oh, my God. The stupendous deserts between the Nuecas and the Bravo Rivers are the natural boundaries between the Anglo-Saxon and the Mauritanian races. Wait, is this, is this talking about the United States of America, the congressional records in the United States of America talking about con uh, Mauritian, Mauritanian races and the natural boundaries between the Anglo-Saxon and Mauritanian races? There ends the Valley of the West where Mexico begins. Wait, Mexico? Wait, I thought Moors were only in Africa. There Mexico begins. There that's beyond the Bravo beginning the Moorish people and their Indian associates to whom Mexico properly belongs. Wait, you got to say that one more time. There begins Mexico. Thence beyond the Bravo begin the Moorish people and their Indian associates to whom Mexico properly belongs, who should not cross the vast desert if they could, as on our side, we too ought to stop there, because interminable conflicts must ensue, either our going south or their coming north of that gigantic boundary. While peace is cherished, that boundary will be sacred. Treaty breakers liars. Not until the spirit of conquest rages will the people on either side. Are you getting it? You getting it? Not the people on either side will molest or mix with each other. And whenever they do, one or the other race must be conquered, if not extinguished. Okay. This is in 1845 now, 1845. Wait, black people were all slaves. We were slaves. We were brought here on the slave ships. We were slaves. We we didn't have empires. Um, they thought we were inferior. They thought we couldn't even read. We didn't have brains. But it says here, number three, and if and where in the providence of God may Negro slavery undergo some radical improvement. I do no mean in this mere preliminary statement more than to allude that much vexed topic. But I believe the passionate denunciation, which on this account met the advent of Texas with curses had been much mitigated. Soberer and better reviews have succeeded. Slavery cannot increase by the annexation of Texas. Probably in the contrary, the African race, the African race may have a chance in Texas or neighboring Mexico of proving that is not inferior to the Caucasian. Some judgments 
is that the doctrine of scripture that the African destiny is not equal to European at any rate, at any rate, Fox, hold on, let me finish. At any rate, their transplant from Africa to the north of the south of North America cannot harm them. We have to do more than just transplant them. And if you would like here, you can go and screenshot that if you will. If you want, you can go ahead and screenshot that. Show all your friends. This is in the congressional records. Like I said, I showed you there. You can go ahead and look it up. So now when we're talking about Negro, colored, and black, I wasn't aware that I belonged to a race called black until I came to America. Very, very important here. William Dungy versus Joseph Spencer case, a time when President Abraham Lincoln was a trial lawyer, trial lawyer and argued for the more William Dungy and won the case. My client is not a Negro. Though it is a crime to be a Negro, no crime to be born with black skin. Though it is a crime to be a Negro, there is no crime to be born with black skin. But my client is not not a Negro. His skin may not be as white as ours, but I say he is not a Negro, though he may be a Moor. Mr. Lincoln interrupted Judge Davis, scarcely able to retain a, spy a smile. You mean Moor, not Moor. Well, your honor, Moor, not C.H. Moor replied Mr. Lincoln with a sweep of his long arm towards the table where Moore and I sat. I sat my, I say my client may be a Moor, but he is not a Negro. I was never black until I moved. Black is not an ethnic group. Black is not. Woo, y'all ready? Are y'all ready? I don't think y'all ready. Y'all ain't ready. Told y'all I'm gonna be hitting heavy. I told y'all I'm be hitting heavy. States and is somebody under the corporate jurisdiction of the United States and is listed on the NASDAQ as human capital, which means that they are technically the inbred or the perpetual preferred stock of the United States corporation, which means that they're not listed as real people. They're not listed as real people because the United States has them listed as human capital. You can look it up. Human capital means the same as a bunch of ones and zeros. These are not, they don't look at you as an individual living soul because the state is set up as a corporation and all corporations in the world have been put under the jurisdiction of the Roman Curia since 1213. Uh, people think that the Magna Carta and that the Constitution of the United States was basically broke that yoke hold that the Vatican or the Pope had on the world but it did not unless you can declare that you are outside of the so-called corporate state that's when you become a national once you become a national what you are saying is that you are represented by a free national association i.e. a free national government that is connected to a republican form of government which is a represent which is a representative form meaning that you are of the land by which you were born. And according to the laws of nationals all over the planet, we all basically are a part of the family of nations. So when you are uh, a national, you are in the family of nations. When you are a citizen of the United States, you are under the United Nations, which means that you are a quasi corporate slave that is under the jurisdiction of an illegal government. The United States is an illegal government or is seen as a rogue government because it is not actually a country. It is a corporation. You can go online to the Delaware corporate, uh, Delaware uh, corporations website and you will see that the United States is listed as the United States of a corporation. And when you look at its status, it's gonna say either delinquent or uh, bankrupt or into receivership. So as a national, if you wanna be recognized as a human and have divine rights, you have to deal with nationality. 
if you want to deal with the privileges, meaning they give you privileges, like however Same you're way. dealing with people who want to now take the national idea out and make you into a naturalized person. A nat to be naturalized means that you are given the rights and privileges of the original people of the land as if you were them, but you are not them. Therefore, mm. you have to be managed. You understand what I'm saying? So when you hear who more is the manager, people, right? So the manager <laughs> is the trust, the trustee who is the United States government that's got you listed as a slave under it, so that way it can tell you what to do and make money off of you, whether you're dead or alive. A national is somebody that don't have to deal with none of that. That's somebody who understands that they, I self law and master, is within them. The true government of the world or the true temple exists within, so say of the Lord. So you put out certain uh, 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 memorandums and stuff like that that let these people know that they can't tread on your liberty. However, that's, like not, said, that's have, not popular. That's not popping. No, because <laughs> because the whole idea of nationalism has been co-opted into things like black nationalism or, or Moorish naturalization, which then well, is really an has... oxymoron because there's no way as a Moor, you're already born on the square. So you're yeah, already we'll talking that. about is when you're dealing with a national sense, you're dealing with the truest aspect of your governmental representation as being a representative of the original family of nations, meaning that you come from the original inhabitants that existed in all the free national governments in the world that consolidated themselves as an empire, right? That eventually consolidated itself into a trust known as the United States of America and Congress Assembly. If you want to be a natural, that means you want to be a citizen of the United States, which means that you are the liquid property of Washington, D.C. So that means they can kill you, they can rape you, they can do whatever they want to do to you, and they don't have to worry about no repercussions. The reason why no other, no other uh, world government has come to the aid of the so-called black man and black woman in America is because you can't go to somebody else's country and take their property. And right now, black men and black women in this country are listed as property. Whether you like it or not, whether you don't like me for saying it, it don't matter. You are listed <laughs> as a piece of property, human capital on the NASDAQ. If you don't own yourself, own your estate, own your free national name, if you do not know what your DNA represents, if you do not know any of these aspects of yourself, they're going to play you they the way they play everybody else. They don't teach.
You got chills? <laughs> You definitely learned something. I'm glad you guys learned something. Um, little Yachty, yes, there was a lot of them in there. Um, 10 out of 10 historical streams. <laughs> Not going down in history. <laughs> as United States citizens, as black, Negro, colored, as all these misnomers that are fictitious labels, okay, that are fictitious labels that were put upon us by our conquerors, okay? By subscribing to those facetious labels, we then become their property, Christian slaves, right? That's why the, the Christian codes, right? The black Christian codes, the slave codes of the South, making all of their Christian property, all right? You must reclaim your name. You must understand your birthright that you are indeed Moors from the North to the South, okay? From the shores of Tripoli, okay? to the halls of Montezuma, all right? Your free national name, you must proclaim your nationality. Black is not a nationality. It can be an ideology. It can now be a culture. I know we are attached to it. Black power, black nationalism, so on and so forth. But as it stands throughout the course of history and what matters most is that they still do things according to law. All right. And if we do not adhere uh, with human law, as he said, why do you think none of these allies, everybody's talking about allies, but um, I hope you guys, you know, enjoy that. Hopefully, hopefully I did a good job. Hopefully I made these connections. Hopefully I was, I think I made um, all the points I wanted to make, especially about learning um, and knowing the entire truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So we do not repeat our mistakes, the same mistakes that keep us, all of us as humanity oppressed.